North Carolina. If you live here, you'll never want to leave. And if you don't live here, well, you'll be back. Anytime is fine. Our consumer advice, Tina Salton on WRAL TV News. Welcome to the First Presbyterian Church Hour with services originating from the First Presbyterian Church, Raleigh, North Carolina. of the psalmist from Psalm 143 call us to worship. Make haste to answer me, O Lord, my spirit fails. Hide not thy face from me, lest I be like those who go down to the pit. Let me hear in the morning of thy steadfast love, for in thee I put my trust. Teach me the way I should go, for to thee I lift up my soul. Let us worship God as we stand and sing together our hymn, God of grace and God of glory, hymn 358.
Let us go to God in prayer as we pray now our prayer of confession. Let us pray together. Dear God, for the day you have given us with all its possibilities, we thank you for your gifts of life and love, of labor and rest. We praise your holy name. Forgive us that too often we are unappreciative while your goodness surrounds us, that we feel alone when there are many who love us, that we despair when your strength is near of hand. Tear down the walls that isolate us, make strong the ties that bind us, and help us to walk together in all your ways through the grace of Jesus Christ and to the power of your spirit. Amen. Listen, here is the good news. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, to forgive us and our failure, to set us free, to make us what we were meant to be. Amen. It is a privilege for us as a congregation now to participate in the sacrament of baptism as Mr. and Mrs. Watson, Bill and Lisa present their son Reed for the sacrament of baptism. The assisting elder is David Bramore. And as we meet now in the chancel, it was also our privilege to receive Bill and Lisa into the membership of the congregation. So we are receiving them by transfer of letter this Sunday, and we shall do this before we have the baptism. <clears throat> Bill was received by transfer from St. Andrew's Episcopal Church of Greensboro, North Carolina, and Lisa by transfer from Christ Lutheran Church of Palatine, Illinois. And the son Drew is here with his younger brother Reed, and Drew was baptized here earlier. And so it's a pleasure for us now to receive Bill and Lisa into the life of this congregation. It's also a privilege, too, to have members of the family who are with us this morning. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Charles Radcliffe are members of this congregation. And attending is Mrs. Flora Gruen Gruninger, who is with us. And uh, in spirit are Bill's parents who live in Danville, uh, California. Bill and Lisa, you've been received into the membership of this congregation from another Christian church. And as we do this, we symbolize that we are members of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And because of this, you do not come to us as strangers, but as a brother and a sister in the Lord. And we welcome you to the worship and work of this people of God here at First Presbyterian Church. It is recorded in the epistle to the Ephesians. There is one body and one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all who is above all and through all and in all. And I address this one question to you. Do you promise to be a faithful member of this congregation, giving of yourself in every way, and by so doing, fulfilling your calling as a disciple of Jesus Christ the Lord? Will you answer, I do? I do. Okay. Let us pray. Gracious God, we ask your blessing on Bill and Lisa and their children. And we're thankful that you call us to serve you in the church, and we're thankful for the reception of them into the life of this congregation as they now present their younger son, Reed, for baptism. In Christ's name, amen. Let us hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. Obeying the word of our Lord Jesus and sure of his presence with us, we baptize those whom he has called to be his own. In Jesus Christ, God has promised to forgive our sins and has joined us together in the family of faith, which is his church. He has delivered us from darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. In Jesus Christ, God has promised to be our Father and to welcome us as brothers and sisters of Christ. Bill and Lisa know that the promises of God are for you and for your children. 
By baptism, God puts his sign on you and them to show that all of you belong to him and gives you Holy Spirit as a guarantee that sharing Christ's reconciling work, you will also share his victory, that dying with Christ to sin, you and they will be raised with him to new life. In presenting your child for baptism, you announce your faith in Jesus Christ and show that you want your son to study him, know him, serve him, and love him as a chosen disciple. And we show your purpose now by answering these questions. Who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Do you trust in him? I do. I do. Do you intend your son to be his disciple, to obey his word, and to show his love? Our Lord Jesus Christ has ordered us to teach those who are baptized. Now, do you, as members of the church, promise to tell this new disciple, read the good news of the gospel, and to help him know all that Christ commands, and by your fellowship, to strengthen his family ties with the household of God? Will you answer? We do. Amen. Let us pray. God, our Father, we thank you for your faithfulness promised in this sacrament and for the hope we have in your Son, Jesus. As we baptize with water, baptize us with Holy Spirit so that what we say may be your word and what we do may be your work. O God, who called us from death to life, we give ourselves to you and with the church through all ages. We thank you for your saving love in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. I don't know if you can bring Reed over. What is the full Christian name of the child? Reed William Watson. Okay. Reed William Watson, child of the covenant, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest and abide with you both now and forevermore. Amen. <coughs> Read, William Watson has been received into the Holy Catholic Church, and those of us who have witnessed this baptism stand with this family because we become extensions of the family. As we witness this baptism, we need to remember our own commitment to Jesus Christ. For as we have witnessed the baptism, we too have taken a promise that we shall become extensions of this, of this family to provide nurture and love and support the young Reed as he grows in nurture and he grows in service to his Lord Jesus Christ. Present him to you now. Haskell, we got Haskell walking. <laughs> yeah, he's going to be. <laughs> he and his brother Drew are real close. <laughs> but we present him to you so you can see who it is that you are now part of in terms of being his family. This is Reed. Peter records in the Acts of the Apostles, repent and be baptized for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off. And thus, in the Presbyterian Reformed tradition, we baptize both adults and children, symbolizing the power of God to work in our weakness to bring us to faith. And as we do so, we celebrate with the family this morning as we welcome Reed, along with his brother Drew and their family in a very special way through this baptism, we welcome Reed into the household of God. Okay. Let us have our prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for your love revealed in Jesus Christ. And we are thankful that Jesus said, Suffer the little children to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. And we're thankful that as we have received Reed into the church this day, we recognize that all of us are your children and all of us to continue to grow in faith by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit and through the encouragement of our family in faith and the body of Christ. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let us stand as we sing together, Jesus loves me.
Please be seated. Good morning and welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church. I invite you to reach for one of the friendship pads located on the center aisle so that you may register and pass that register along the pew. As we do so, we reflect the oneness of the body of Christ. We welcome today, too, those of you who are worshiping with us by way of WRAL-TV. We covet your prayers and your support for this special ministry, and we're thankful for your participation in the life of this congregation through this service. As you pass the register, and you notice the names of visitors with us, and if you are a member sitting next to a guest or visitor this Sunday, please, at the appropriate time, extend the right hand of welcome to these individuals. And if you are looking for a church home as a guest or here this morning, there is an appropriate place to check on the friendship pad, your interest in membership. The session does meet each Sunday on call to receive individuals by transfer of letter, reaffirmation of faith or of our profession of faith in Jesus Christ. And we invite you to join with us here in Christian discipleship. If you are a guest or visitor, you are invited at the close of the service to go to the parlor, and there in a more informal way we can greet you and welcome you here this Sunday. So if you're a member and you're sitting next to a guest or visitor, uh, have the courage to ask them to go with you to the parlor for some coffee after the uh, worship service this Sunday. As the session met this Sunday, we received a lady who was not able to be present, so we received her in absentia. She is Mrs. Robert Hertzler, Peggy, who was received by transfer of letter from First Presbyterian Church of Englewood, New Jersey. Uh, Peggy Hertzler is a resident of Blue Ridge Manor, and because of the extenuating circumstances, was not physically able to be present at the session meeting this Sunday morning to be received. So we welcome Peggy into the life of this congregation. In the worship bulletin, you notice that the church office of nominating committee has begun its work. There is an invitation for you to submit names to the committee to be considered for the office of elder and deacon. Please feel free to leave those in the church office or to give them to David Worth, who is the moderator for the church office of nominating committee. As indicated to those who are worshiping with us this Sunday at the service, uh, I shall be uh, traveling back to Texas to be with my house, and as a moving van comes to Wichita Falls to load the furniture up on Wednesday. But in order to do that, I must be at the airport at 12.30 uh, today to catch a plane shortly after 1. So uh, at the close of this service, after I have the benediction, I shall put on my track shoes, and I shall be... Uh, <laughs> back to my study and out of my robe and in a car or heading to the airport. So this Sunday, I shall not be at one of the doors to greet you at the uh, close of the worship service. We shall be back uh, in Raleigh Sunday evening, September the 14th. Uh, we shall be walking through the new residence with the contractor on the 15th, closing on the house on the 16th, and the furniture should be here on schedule early in the morning on the 17th so that we can move in. But uh, we look forward to this, and I look forward personally to having my family uh, with me here and all of us here in Raleigh and not back in Wichita Falls, Texas. Let us hear the Word of God now as we read our Gospel lesson, which is found as John, the sixth chapter of John, reading verses 51 through 58. be reading from the Revised Standard Version. Let us hear the Word of God. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, 
and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not such as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. This he said in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. May God bless to our reading and to our understanding this passage of Holy Scripture. Amen. Let us hear the word of God as we read now from 2 Samuel, from chapter 18, verses 24 through 33. As we consider the topic this Sunday morning, cry for the beloved one. We step into the midst of a narrative, a tragic narrative. The story of the rebellious son Absalom and his tragic death and the announcement of that death to King David. Let us hear the word of God. Now David was sitting between the two gates, and the watchman went up to the roof of the gate by the wall. And when he lifted up his eyes and looked, he saw a man running alone. And the watchman called out and told the king. And the king said, If he is alone, there are tidings in his mouth. And he came apace and drew near. And the watchman saw another man running. And the watchman called to the gate and said, See, another man running alone. The king said, He also brings tidings. 
And the watchman said, I think the running of the foremost is like the running of Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok. And the king said, he is a good man and comes with good tidings. Then Ahimaaz cried out to the king, all is well. And he bowed before the king with his face to the earth and said, Blessed be the Lord your God, who has delivered up the men who raised their hand against my Lord, the king. And the king said, Is it well with the young man Absalom? Ahimaaz answered, When Joab sent your servant, I saw a great tumult, but I do not know what it was. And the king said, Turn aside and stand here. So he turned aside and stood still. And behold, the Cushite came. And the Cushite said, Good tidings for my lord the king. For the Lord has delivered you this day from the powers of all who rose up against you. The king said to the Cushite, Is it well with the young man Absalom? And the Cushite answered, May the enemies of my lord, the king, and all who rise up against you for evil be like that young man. And the king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, he said, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would I have died instead of you? O oh, Absalom, my son. May God bless to our reading and to our understanding this passage of Holy Scripture. Let us pray. Gracious God, open the windows to our souls that we too may receive comfort and strength. For we too have areas of our lives where there is pain, where we cry for the beloved ones of our family and friends and acquaintances. Help us to grow in faith as this story speaks to us this day. In Christ's name, amen. I was driving home from a presbytery meeting in Texas. I'd been to Lubbock. I lived in Wichita Falls, and that means miles and miles of nothing between Wichita Falls and Lubbock. There are a few communities, but it's miles and miles of nothing. A lot of jackrabbits, a lot of sand, a lot of cows, no towns, much. And as I was driving back, the music I was listening to as I was coming down from the Cat Rock, heading toward Wichita Falls, and the Cat Rock is that high plains area where the altitude is almost, what's 3,000 3, feet above sea level. Reception is pretty good there. As I was heading down from the Cat Rock toward Wichita Falls, a news bulletin came on with the tragic news that President Reagan had been shot. And the announcer said, it appears that it was done by a young man. And I kept on listening, and reports kept on coming in. And finally, it was, it was identified who did it. And I felt grief for the president and for the press secretary and for the policeman who had been shot. But then it became apparent that the man's name was John Hinckley. And I began to think about John Hinckley about his parents, about the pain they must be in. Suddenly hearing on the news, and the next day on the, on the TV and, on, and reading the newspaper, splashed across the pages the story of their son who had done such a terrible thing. Their cry for the beloved one, their son, and the pain in their souls. Our scripture passage from 2 Samuel describes the pain, which is a modern pain. For in every one of our families, our acquaintances, our colleagues at work, there is some part of that relationship where there can be pain and has been pain because there are individuals whom we appreciate and love who for one reason or another have not lived well with their freedom of responsibility have done terrible things, and we grieve. David was grieving. As our scripture lesson opened, he was awaiting word. Yes, he was hoping there would be victory. But more importantly, 
He wanted word about his rebellious son. And he kept on asking, is it well? Is it well with the young man, Absalom? Is it well with the young man, Absalom? Grief, agony, crying for the beloved one. And the answer of the Cushite was such a roundabout one the conclusion could only be there that Absalom was dead. And the scripture says, as recorded, the chronicle records here, David went to his chambers and wept, Oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, would I have died instead of you? Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. An ancient cry, but a modern cry. For in all our lives, Somewhere there is pain for a beloved one. How do we cope with that pain? Where does the comfort and the strength come from to deal with that pain? Well, the focus for the sermon this Sunday is this. And we as Christians need to proclaim it. That God's soulless comfort and strength is ours as we cry for the beloved one. God's comfort, strength, and solace is ours as we cry for the beloved one. Disappointments come in all shapes and sizes. For the son and daughter who drops out of school or who have to get a divorce or a business colleague who has betrayed trust, a member of the family whose alcoholism has gotten so acute that that person's life and the family and the business is being destroyed. A friend who has betrayed trust in school. In so many areas of our lives, if we were to peel off the veneer, there is pain because of the beloved ones in our lives. And David was no different. Where do we get the comfort and the strength to cope? The textbook of faith is our scriptures. Flesh and blood people who had to cope with life and weaknesses and foibles and disappointments. The memory of faith is in Holy Scripture. And there's none more poignant account than the agony of David for his son Absalom. Absalom, gifted, Absalom. Without blemish, Scripture says, Absalom, handsome, Absalom, Absalom, a leader. Absalom was a gifted person, a person of action, an individual who was concerned for justice and who would volunteer his time to sit at the gates to arbitrate matters of justice for people. Well, that's the way they did it in the Near East at that time, the Middle East. The judges would sit at the gates to arbitrate disputes among the people, and he was concerned about the lack of justice, and he would go there and offer his services to arbitrate. That was the kind of person he was. And he loved his sister Tamar, and he, he grieved when she was violated sexually, and he had his half-brother killed out of justice. That's the kind of person Absalom was, a person who felt deeply, who loved deeply. Absalom, though, was caught up though with his ego. And he listened to the complaints brought against his father's kingdom by the ten northern tribes and decided that he on his own would attempt to correct it. And so he rebelled. He rebelled against his father and against the Lord's anointed. But in spite of all that, his father loved him. As we read in Scripture, as David was sending his troops out, he commanded them, deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. But Absalom's forces, his raw recruits, were no match for David's seasoned veterans, and the forces of Absalom were scattered, and they scattered in all directions for their lives, including Absalom on his mount. And in his haste to dodge a tree, with overhanging branches, low branches. He stooped but didn't stoop far enough, and the branches of the tree caught his beard, and the mount left him hanging like a pig hung for the slaughter, and he was. 
hanging there by his beard in an oak tree. And there they found him. And there he was killed. And as our story opens today, David is awaiting word. Two runners are sent out. Ahimaaz and the Cushite. And Ahimaaz outdistances the Cushite. He comes first and gives the word of victory, but David is more concerned about his son. What of the young man? What of the young man, Absalom? And the second runner comes, the Cushite. He tells a victory, but he also, he also tells of the death of Absalom. And the cry of David is the cry of any one of us, any one of us who grieves because of the foibles and the failures and the weaknesses of one whom we love as a member of our own families, acquaintances, friends, colleagues. O oh, Absalom, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, would I have died instead of you? O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Even when nothing has been done wrong, as parents, we would gladly give ourselves to take the place of a loved one if that loved one was to undergo something traumatic. And at times when our daughter was having surgery after surgery after surgery as a young girl, she had 30 fractures and 16 operations because of her bone problem, we grieved and wished at times we could put ourselves in her place. But it's even at times more painful if it could be, when someone has done something so wrong that the pain lodges in our souls and we wish we could take their place. That occurred in our family. I was a student at Union Theological Seminary, 22 years old in Richmond, Virginia, and I received a letter one day from my parents, my cousin. had been placed in the Federal Juvenile Detention Center in Washington, D.C., 15 years old. Shocked. Little Woody, you know, I remembered him as Little Woody. Little Woody used to come over to the house as a two-year-old at Christmas time to get the Christmas presents, and Little Woody with his eyes as big as saucers. Could that be the one? Little Woody would come over as a seven- or eight-year-old and go up to my room and, and, and look at all my model airplanes. You know, the same fella, Little Woody. Yes, at 15 years old, he had not exercised freedom and responsibility very well. And that day, he had cut school, played, was truant. And he and two friends had decided to take a jar ride, and they had hotwired a car and had driven it across the state line from Louisiana to Mississippi, a federal offense. And now, he was in Washington, D.C., at the Federal Juvenile Detention Center. And I made arrangements to go to see him, and at the whole time, I was agonizing with my family and his mother and father. The pain was there. Where do we get the comfort, the strength, the solace to deal with it? We get it from God. God and Jesus Christ for us as Christians, the God of Scripture. As a pastor, I'm aware of not only the foibles and weaknesses of members of my own family, but I'm also aware that as I look out on this sanctuary and as those of you who are participating in worship this morning by way of TV, behind every face, if we live long enough, there's pain because of a loved one. God gives us comfort and strength to deal with this pain. God gives us, through this comfort and strength, perspective in two different ways. First, to realize that we're all moral creatures who have to exercise responsibility and freedom. And secondly, God's comfort and strength can deal with our guilt with this pain. God's comfort and strength enables us to gain a perspective in our agony that all of us are moral creatures. We cannot live someone else's life for him or her. 
And yes, we grieve when they do something wrong. But that individual, at some point in his life or her life, must learn how to exercise freedom and responsibility. As I read the story of the prodigal son, I read of a father who had raised a son, knowing all the values of what is right and wrong, but the son asks for his inheritance, and the father lets him go with the inheritance. The son must learn how to make the decisions of right and wrong in the midst of how he encounters life. And the father is aware of all that is out there, but he lets the son go out of love. But he stands ready as the story unfolds, to forgive the son when that son in weakness and with indiscretion misuses that freedom. Jesus, as he rides into Jerusalem, cries over the city. That last week of his life, he realizes that the very individuals whom he has come to serve are the very individuals who will put him on the cross. Those whom he has fed, those whom he has healed, those representatives of those folks will be there in Jerusalem that week to crucify him. And he cries for the beloved ones. And on the cross, he cries, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He cries for you and me, who in our sinfulness, our humanness, engage in sin. He loves us to that extent that on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He loves us, not condoning the wrong act. He loves us and is willing to forgive us, to help us grow out of our indiscretion, to reclaim life in spite of human weakness and failure. We cannot live someone else's life. They are moral creatures having to exercise freedom and responsibility. But secondly, God's comfort and strength enables us to realize that guilt can be lifted. For so often when someone in our family does something wrong, we think, because of cause and effect, that we have caused it. We must come to realize that God's love and strength can, can remove that guilt of what if. What if? What if I had not missed Johnny's sixth birthday? He may not have done that at 15 years of age. Well, that, that's, we have that kind of pain. We want to make those kind of connections, but so often we label under the guilt of what if. What if I had not gotten angry with Joan when she said she and Derek wanted to marry and there's only one month to get ready for all these preparations and Joan and Derek have some marital problems. We think if I had somehow not been angry with Joan, then maybe they would not have these problems. What if? And our concern for our loved ones, we, we labor on this guilt of what if? Well, God's bountiful love is such that his mercy both forgives us and those for whom we cry as the beloved ones. God's love is strong enough and broad enough to forgive us and to remove that guilt, but also to forgive the loved one when he and she comes to the awareness of what they have done to move past that. To be human is to cry for the beloved one. And God understands us in our humanness and does not forsake us and identifies with us because he too cried for us from the cross. So we worship a God in Jesus Christ whose love is broad enough and powerful enough to support us when in any circumstance of life you and I cry for the beloved one family member, a colleague, a friend. But as we do so, we need to remember a prayer. A prayer. It is not original with me. A prayer which, whose origin is, is that of Reinhold Niebuhr, really, written years ago. And has since been adopted and used by other groups. When we cry out in the words of Absalom, oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, would that I have died instead of you, oh, Absalom, my son, and my son, and that becomes our cry because of whatever is our circumstance. We need to reach out for God's grace and strength, and we need to pray a prayer something like this. Lord Jesus, let me accept the things I cannot change and the courage to change the things I can. 
and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. As we respond to the gospel and to God's good news of love and forgiveness, meeting our needs as human beings, let us now stand and affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. <clears throat> I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son of the Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
us now go to God in prayers. We offer to him our prayers of intercession and thanksgiving. Let us pray. Gracious God, we are thankful for your grace which claims us in Jesus Christ. We are thankful for the gift of your forgiving love which sets us on our feet again, which removes our guilt, and which places hope and joy in our hearts and minds for the tasting of life each day as we share it with all your children. We're thankful for this community of faith and for the community of faith expressed in denominations of the body of Christ, which nurture and support us for the power of your Holy Spirit. O merciful God, who art our shepherd and defender, hear now our prayers for ourselves and for others. When we are beset by life's pressures and increase the tempo of activities to compensate and thus grow numb because of the drain physically and emotionally of our energies, assist us with the encouragement of others to break this self-defeating cycle. Give us perspective and inner strength by your spirit to cope without engaging in self-destructive activities. For loving God, we pray for courage to be your faithful disciples. May we not be embarrassed to claim you in every arena of life, personally and corporately, whether at home or at work or in social activities or in recreational activities or wherever. May our discipleship not be lukewarm, but constant, reflecting the costliness of your grace for us in Jesus Christ. For you were never embarrassed to claim us. And we pray for the Christian church and all of its many branches. May we respect the diversity of traditions without demeaning what we do not understand. And may we be open to affirm the oneness we profess under you as Lord of the church, which calls us to work together as brothers and sisters in the Lord here in Raleigh and North Carolina and Virginia, across this land and beyond. O God of peace, who calls us to wholeness and spiritual health, assist us as Christians to be your peacemakers, to work for peace and justice in the name of Christ here in our community and cross geographic and national boundaries. Help us to understand the yearning in the souls of others, which we have. This yearning not to live under the paralysis of prejudice or the violation of human rights or the threat of psychological and physical harm due to, due to lawlessness or to nuclear annihilation because of miscalculation. And assist our leaders to seek your wisdom in charting decisions and measuring the consequences in the human arena where there is so much sin and so much selfishness. Help us to be your agents of reconciliation in our peacemaking. O oh, divine physician, we pray for those who are sick in body and in mind this day, those whom you know about, those about whom we are greatly concerned. And especially we ask that you would participate with those who are with us this day by way of WRAL-TV. And may those who are viewing this service who are sick or who are convalescing from illness know of your comfort and strength as well. And especially we remember and our church family the following, Margaret Jones in the hospital and Tempe Hardesty and Norman Rinaldi, who was convalescing from his open-heart surgery, and others who are near and dear to us, whom we lift up to you in prayer. For we make this prayer in the name of our Lord, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
as we respond to the mercies of God extended to us in prayer, and as we respond to the love and the forgiveness of God, we now in worship commit ourselves to the ministry of the good news through this offering. It is written in Scripture, the Acts of the Apostles, that it is more blessed to give than to receive. What we give this day is multiplied by the gift of God so that others too may know of the good news of life and love and forgiveness and thus, and thus have hope because of our commitment. Let us worship God with our tithes and our offerings. of support may be sent to First Presbyterian Church, Box 4, Raleigh, North